content as such an important component. Historically, black and brown folks have been excluded from Hollywood, been excluded from publishing. Our stories have been excluded from history. And if we don't have control of narrative, if we don't have an opportunity to tell our stories and create our stories, well, there is no input or that input is very minimal. So we see that bias show up over and over again. And the opportunity we actually have now is students and our communities now have the opportunity to be the creators of our stories, of our narratives, which also in turn in turn means we are controlling the inputs in these data sets. And over time, we can have a significant impact in shifting what that bias looks like, what the outputs that are coming out, not just the black and brown users, but also the white users um, as they're using these models and as they're using our platforms that we build. So I think that becomes important where that issue won't be solved today, but when we look at the long-term impact that we can have, that can be significant. What's going on guys, it's Jay Joe Goose Sneaker Principal. And in this video, I wanna to talk to you about something that I've learned, um, or at least an awareness I've come about in my exploration of into artificial intelligence and working to have a deeper understanding on, of, of what it is and how it can impact education. So um, in the past two months, I've attended two, actually not two, not two months, past month actually, a couple of weeks, I've attended two events. One was the, New York City Advisory Council on AI. So I guess it was the AI Advisory Council that had a, um, a showcase and panels talking about artificial intelligence and its impact on schools, our community, and what the future looks like with artificial intelligence, especially in education. Then yesterday I attended the um, Manhattan AI Summit that was um, uh, put together by the superintendent of um, Manhattan High Schools. And both events were pretty interesting and there's a lot of learning to happen in those two spaces and i want to share my thoughts on what i learned but also shared some insights that i came about from those experiences so the first one would be the ai advisory council um during that meeting there were panels in there and it was kind of an open conversation there were superintendents in the room principals in the, in the room there were people that were pretty much categorized as ai forward and AI curious um, leaders. And I think I'm one of those AI forward. I have embraced it from, from jump from the jump. Um, the first time I saw Terminator and um, 2001 Space Odyssey and Star Trek, I've been waiting for the world in which I can engage with technology the way we're able to do it right now, even though it's rudimentary, but still we're in a space where we're able to engage technology in ways that we didn't imagine possible um, beyond you know the fantasies of television and movies but um so i digress so in this space this is what i what i saw i saw a lot of people who were really in trying to get um beyond their understandings their their fears and those who were willing to say hey i've embraced this this is what i do and it was it was quite it was quite interesting because at one point in time you could feel the energy in the room being kind of like Bloods and Crips. It was like those who were like, mm, we're not ready for this. And those who were like, oh no, come on, we gotta jump on this because if we don't get up on this, we're gonna be left behind like we've been left behind several times. And what we mean by we, those of us, especially because a lot of us leaders are, are leading schools that are in the inner cities, in the, in, in the urban communities that services minority um, children and um, minority communities. And you, we know what happens in those spaces. Typically, when technology comes, it moves forward and we're held back. And often, the reasons that we're being told that things are being held back has to do with, you know, safety and ethical concerns and, and how do we protect and all these different things. And as these things are happening, these conversations are, being, are happening in other communities, they're moving forward much faster. And by the time we realize what's happened, we are so far behind and we're playing catch up. And we've been playing catch up for for decades, and, um, and it's interesting because when you think about when people when people talk about the achievement gap, the achievement gap is also majorly a technology gap as well, and it's usually who you know when people say first to market, it's also first to use, 
Who uses it first? Who's understanding it? Who's actually applying it first? Those spaces, those communities tend to, to excel. So doing the, the, um, the AI uh, advisory council meeting uh, or presentation, I mean, there were people out there who were, who were talking about like, you know, we can't move forward with this. It's not safe. We have to make sure that we come together, understand, establish policies and things like that to make sure that we put, we're protecting and we're, we're, we are engaging in ensuring that, that the parameters and the rules of an engagement and ethical issues are being observed and making sure that the technology itself is not spewing biased content and things of that nature. And how do we make sure that the information that's being given is, 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 is true and not false? And I remember sitting there and thinking to myself, not, not as an educator, as a student, one of the classes, I, one of the, not classes, the span of learning that I, that I went through in school was research, was, you know, looking at primary and secondary sources. And back then we were just talking about the library. We weren't, we weren't even talking about internet. I was, I was, generation right at the cusp. When I got to college is when I first time I ever, ever heard about email. And, and back then we had Telnet. And it was just the dark screen, the, the what do you call it? It was either the black screen with white text or green text. And you're typing, you pretty much typing rudimentary code to send emails, receive emails. That was the internet. That's all it was, trans, transferring the information. So when we talked about like in 1993, you know, when I first got to college and we were, t and we were still talking about books, when you find this article in the stacks and you open it, you read it, how do you confirm that this information is correct? Because even in the library, in the stacks, there is false information in there. If you find an article, you know, that's out there, how do you confirm that article is correct? By, by comparing the sources and, and do, doing deeper dives. This is what we talked about when we just had paper and um, what is, what, what, microfiche, microfiche, remember that? You have the strip of film, you go through the machine and you find articles and things like, like, of, that, of that nature. It wasn't just pulling information out and just applying it to your, to your writing or, or to your presentation. You actually have to confirm the information. And I don't know why now we're, that we're not saying the same things when it comes to the internet. It's almost like we're saying that the internet has to give us true information. We know that's not true. We know that we still have to do our due diligence as researchers, as thinkers, as critical thinkers. Like we still have to do that, but we're not teaching that. We're just saying, oh, be careful, AIs will give you wrong information. But it's still your responsibility to get information and confirm it, right? But again, that was a lot of things I was hearing. Oh, the biases in there. Um, I'm sorry, biases have been in literature forever. Some of the greatest scholars that we still quote to this day is Freud and, and Freud and Jung and all these other people, historians and psychologists, a lot of them had extreme biases against minorities and people of color. Let me say, let me not say minorities, but people of color or people that was outside of their culture, you know? Um, but we still hold them in esteem and we still say, well, during those times, these were the biases that they held, but it doesn't change the fact that at the core of the work they were doing, there was extreme truths in there and, and, and extreme, um, movement made for humanity through their work. But we still have to use our critical thinking to assess that data and that information. So when people talk about AI, what is spewing out there? And that was a lot of it, you know, and I was like, okay, this is interesting. And at the end of the day, though, somebody on stage was saying, we have to use it. We have to use it. We have to engage in it. And people were saying AI, 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 AI. And it's interesting because at the tail end of this conversation, I'm going to tell you why maybe using the word AI by itself is the wrong thing. So now let's fast forward to yesterday. Yesterday, a LaGuardia High School got there, walked into the building, and I'll be honest with you, I wasn't sure what I was walking into. I got the invite, I RSVP'd. Being a busy principal, I didn't really do a deep read into it. I just saw um, AI, uh, Manhattan AI Summit, I knew I had to be there. I walked in and I saw sitting on stage the two people that caught my attention first, um, was Colin Kaepernick. I was like, oh, number seven is in the house. You can't miss the fro. And then he was sitting with um, City Councilwoman Rita Joseph. Amazing, amazing politician. But not only that, um, a former teacher, uh, a technophile, you know, 
a woman after my heart because the way she talks about how she taught her classroom, how she engaged in technology always amazed me. And I was like, that's how it should be, right? So they were there and there was other panelists that were talking about AI, artificial intelligence. And, and again, it was coming from a space of, that was a little bit different from what I saw at the AI, AI um, Advisory Council um, conference. This was more about, hey, how are we using it? Why do we need to use it? What do we need to do to not, let, not be left behind? How do we get past our fears and our biases and all these concerns that we have, understanding this thing is here? One of the things that I heard was this, and I've mentioned this before. When we tell our children about future jobs, you know, and careers, do we even know what we're talking about? When we say STEM jobs and STEM careers and STEM, 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 do we even know what those things are? Oh, they should be coders. What happened when the code starts coding itself? Would there be room for an army of coders? Or do you just need two or three or four or five or a hundred billion coders on the planet who now manage the, the, the artificial intelligence that is now doing the abundance of coding based on the directions and, and, and the prompts being given to it by these master minds, these master coders, these human beings who are the ones manipulating the, the, the system. You know, what does it mean to be a surgeon in 30 years? Somebody said for kindergartners, and it hit me, because right now, I believe the kindergartners right now are graduating in 2035, if I'm right, I might be wrong about that, but 2035, let me, hold on, let me think about kindergartners right now, 13 years, um, 12, uh, 36. 2036, our kindergartners are going to be walking the stage. What is the world going to look like in 2036? I couldn't have imagined 2024, 13 years ago. We have electric cars, and now we're talking about AI robots, uh, what do you call it? Um, um, Tesla talking about robots and and we're we're in this space now where we're web 2, 2.0 we're moving to web 2.3 or I'm sorry we're in 2.3 crypto all these things that might seem not a big deal right now if you try to explain it to me 13 years ago I'd looked at you and been like what are you talking about what are you talking about you know this is like some sci-fi stuff I would have been excited but I, but my brain would not have been able to wrap myself around a decentralized currency that's digital that 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 has a limit that keeps increasing in value and has cyclical three, three four year cycles you know that can disrupt banking the banking system then now there's etfs that is based on bitcoin i would have been like what the what but these are reality so imagine what it looks like for, in 2036. i have two i have two kindergartners right now and i'm trying to in my head trying to say to ask myself what am I telling my kids to be when they grow up or to, to even imagine? I don't even know. I just, I have to literally just say, you could be anything you want to be because in the truth of the matter is, I don't know what the future holds for them. You know, so they would say, they were talking about these different things. And I thought, wow, this is incredible. You know, like they, there was some thinking here. And they, then they had students who, who, who spoke about how they're using it, these, you know, how they're using technology, the, um, the AI and technology. And um, some of them, you know, even kind of alluded to the fact that almost like they didn't want their teachers to know because there's this still perception that by using this technology, it's cheating. But it's funny because I remember when using a calculator was considered cheating. I, I, I remember when not going to the library, but rather using the internet was considered cheating or not, or not real research. And now going to a library seems bizarre. What are you talking about going to a library and finding a physical book? You just download it to your phone. You know, I remember when reading was paramount, but now you can have your whole entire reading for your doctoral program, for your master's program or your bachelor's degree program and listen to the audio version read to you by Snoop Doggy Dog's voice. I said Snoop Doggy Dog by Snoop's voice. Think about that. This is the world we're living in now. You can have Patrick, Patrick Stewart, you know, Jean-Luc Picard from Star Trek, his voice generated by AI reading your compulsory reading for school to you as you're driving to work, as you're riding on a train, as you're 
um, jogging, or you're working on the gym. But once upon a time, you have to sit there and put those books with a highlighter. The world we live in now. So these are the things we were talking about. I thought to myself, wow. And even publicly saying, have teachers use AI to plan. Not just write your lesson plan, but ask it to take a lesson plan and gamify it. Create activities using the AI to help you expand the limits that you have on what you can do in your classrooms. These are things that were that was being talked about. And I was thoroughly impressed, thoroughly impressed. But then something happened. One of the, the panelists, I'm sorry, I forget his name. He mentioned this whole notion of He said generative singularity, but I'm going to take liberties and, and call it cognitive singularity. And let me tell you why this is important. Because we use the word AI, not understanding that artificial intelligence is kind of like the, the bubble, the, the core of the technology and its potential. Because intelligence, when we talk about humanity, is linked inseparable from our ability to be self-reliant, self-governing, our creativity, our individuality. It's when we, when we talk about intelligent life form. But when we say artificial intelligence, we're not saying that it's less than. We're saying intelligence that is maybe one day, not even maybe, well, one day is equal to our ability to do the things I just mentioned. However, this is something that was artificially created. At least in the beginning. But what happens when the intelligence creates its own intelligence? Is it still artificial? It's only artificial at this stage because we're the ones programming it, writing its algorithm, writing the thing, coding it. But what happens when it codes itself? But when this was mentioned, I was like, and, and this was mentioned in, in the sense of like, we're not even thinking about that next level, which is already probably here. We don't know. There are things that are being created all the time that we're, that by the time it comes to market, it's been working for the past 50 years. So we don't even know what the possibilities of what's out there right now, right? But check this out. So when we're talking about education in schools and the technology that we're in, that we're clamoring over, when we talk about ChatGPT, perplexity, and all these different um, programs and APIs and everything that that connects this thing that's under the umbrella of artificial intelligence, it's very important that we realize that right now what we're really talking about in, for education is really two things. One is machine learning, the other one is deep learning. And, and separating it from programs. A program is something that's created to do a particular thing. And if you want to do something else, you as the coder, you as the creator has to go in there and change its programming to do something else or to add on to it. So for example, when you say, I'm going to open Microsoft Word. Microsoft Word is which is, is a digital document creator that you click open, you type in there, you can shape your paragraphs and bold and highlight and do whatever you want to add pictures. And it does exactly what it's told to do. And if they say, hey, now we can, you can link your Microsoft Word to Excel, that is a piece of code that connects both of them. But everything there is controlled by you. But now, when we talk about machine learning, we're creating an algorithm that says here, we're going to put information into you and you're going to learn. You will learn and you will learn to do to 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 do certain tasks and maybe even all tasks. But in the process, you're getting better because you're learning. So when you go to ChatGPT, the original version, you said, hey, I you know, is the world flat? And it says, yes, the world is flat because it went online and, get, and and found all these places that where it says the world is flat. 
and you're like, oh, this is wrong. No, it's still learning. And if you say to it, give me a counter argument about the world being flat, it finds it and says, oh, now give me the history of the world being flat versus the world being not, not flat. Then it's pulling information and after a while, it starts to realize it's an argument that's been happening. And this is the evidence to support one versus the other okay, the world is not flat, but however, the whole notion about the world being flat came from here and that, see what I'm saying? So it's learning, you know? One thing I've learned about ChatGPT, I use it all the time, and two years in, I have an account that has hundreds of conversations in there, and I'm realizing when I open a new conversation, it knows who the account owner is, it knows what my tendencies are. It knows like for my editing, how I like my 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 um, edits look like and the patches look like and remove this, add this, shift this, language, and it's learning me. Machine learning, okay? But now, deep learning is learning me and learning the space in which I'm functioning and it's also adding other layers to it. Almost like the way we think. We don't think in a, in a singular in a singular um, path. We're thinking a singular path as other things are connecting to what we're doing and what we're saying and how we're functioning. That's that next level. And this is where we are right now. Every all the programs and everything that's being created, we have to ask ourselves: if when we say AI, is this machine learning? Is this thing learning us and us being able to pour into it and us learning it as well? Or are we just playing with programs that are pre-programmed and we're being taught as AI? And the only reason I'm saying this, and I'm going to end this video because I intended for it to be this long, is like there are so many companies out here who are now saying AI, 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 AI. And my question is, are you producing services that is inherently machine learning that is also getting better as we use it for the tasks that we would want it for in our schools? Or is it just full information, running a program, you know, an algorithm, whatever the case is, and giving us what seems to be machine learning or seems to be deep learning? That's my question. Because the reason I'm saying this is because every time now I'm noticing, I mean, it's only been two events, but I'm noticing there's a lot of companies, a lot of vendors who are coming to these spaces and they're, I talk about a lot of screaming AI, 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 but my question is: Is it truly AI? Is it truly under the umbrella of um, machine learning or deep learning, with the extension or the con the connective tissue to this technology that we need to master and understand that is going to be a big part of our our human evolution, or are we just playing with a toy and being told us? It's, it's, it's AI. So I'm going to stop right here. So the things I want you to take a walk, walk away with from this conversation is number one, understanding that AI is just, a, you know, from my understanding, it's just kind of a, a, an umbrella under which there are layers, machine learning, deep learning, then that cognitive singularity. When eventually, when, if not already, when the AI itself is able to independently function and improve upon itself without our involvement in that process. What is that going to look like? I'm an advocate for us making sure in our schools that we're using it, that we're becoming great at prompt engineering and having our students understand that what we're doing now is how, trying to figure out how to take this technology and manipulate it for the betterment of humanity. All right, we change Joker's Sneaker Principle. Have an amazing rest of your day, and I'll talk to you soon. Be well.